ask you to take your Bibles and turn with me this morning to Luke 14. Luke 14, um, <clears throat> this passage this morning is directed uh, specifically for a purpose, and I'm not going to necessarily teach on that purpose this morning, but it's an object and illustration that there's multiple applications to, and so I want to give you just a parable idea of what Jesus brings up, and then we're going to use this as a springboard to get into our new lesson on winning the small battles, lesson number five. The title of this lesson is Preparing for Battle. Preparing for Battle. Luke chapter 14, verse number 27. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counts the cost, whether he have sufficient funds to build it? Lest happily after he hath laid the foundation, he's not able to finish it. And that behold, it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassador and desires a condition of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on our message this morning. Father, it's very important principles we find here as Jesus is using parables with extremely important applications. And Jesus, particularly in this passage, talks about counting the costs, preparing for the future, knowing what is coming. And Lord, I understand that there is a push for discipleship, that being a Christian isn't a fad it's just not this casual thing that we should adopt with insincerity. We don't attend church or act like Christians because uh, it gives us a better social setting. But there is truly a cost to discipleship. And that if we're going to prepare for battle, to win the daily victories, we have to prepare. We have to know what's ahead of us. And we have to prepare today. Father, I agree with John the Baptist when he said, I must decrease and Christ must increase. Hide this foolish preacher behind the cross of Christ that Christ alone might be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Neville Chamberlain was a British conservative politician who served as prime minister over the United Kingdom from May 1937 until May 1940. I have to confess that Neville Chamberlain is not one of my favorite characters in history. His foreign policy at the onset of World War II was known as appeasement philosophy. The Axis powers of Germany, Italy, and Japan showed extreme aggression, while Chamberlain believed that Everything would be much better if we did not provoke Hitler to more opposition. His philosophy was actually popular at the time inside the United Kingdom. But the problem with his don't poke a sleeping bear philosophy was that Hitler was not a sleeping bear. He was a roaring, raging grizzly trying to conquer the world. Hitler knew that Chamberlain's desire for peace could be taken advantage of, and that's exactly what Hitler did. He took over Austria and Czechoslovakia while Britain sat by and watched. Chamberlain gave in to Hitler time and time again. Chamberlain didn't want to enter World War II. Chamberlain lacked perception and the ability to discern the danger of his enemy. 
Until the bitter end of his ruling as prime minister, he was still unwilling to distrust Adolf Hitler and Mussolini. He longed for peace at any cost. Still beloved by many, Chamberlain resigned his position on May 9th, 1940. In his radio address, he said this, For the hour has now come when we are to be put to the test. As the innocent people of Holland, Belgium, and France are being tested already, and you and I must rally behind our new leader, and with our united strength and with unshakable courage we must fight and work until the wild beast which has sprung out of his lair upon us has been finally disarmed and overthrown. It took a resignation of Chamberlain to actually admit that action needed to occur. Queen Elizabeth told Chamberlain that her daughter, Princess Elizabeth, actually wept at the broadcast as she loved Chamberlain dearly. Little did the Queen know, and little did Chamberlain know, that his resignation unleashed a storm that Adolf Hitler had never seen. The storm's name was Winston Churchill. Churchill, as he replaced Chamberlain, was a man that was willing to fight. He refused to consider defeat or surrender, and the words compromise and appeasement were not in the man's vocabulary. Churchill immediately formed a war cabinet. He was quoted at saying that his life up until this point had been preparation for this hour of trial. By the end of May 1940, many called in for England to actually surrender as it seemed the darkest hour would not pass. But Churchill refused, and he resolved to fight on. In his famous speech to the House of Commons, Churchill said, We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island. Whatever the cost may be, we shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. After the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, the United States joined Winston Churchill, strengthening the Allied powers and ending and marking a major shift in World War II by 1942. The momentum had changed. The difference between the two prime ministers of the United Kingdom during World War II was remarkable. One was not ready for war. He tried to avoid it at all costs and did not prepare. I believe if Chamberlain stayed in as prime minister, you might be living in Germany today. But Winston Churchill was prepared for battle. We've been speaking about the spiritual battles that we as Christians face daily. This war is very real. We can't just run into battle against Satan, the world, and the flesh without counting the costs, without being prepared without knowing what is to come, without training today. That will lead you to failure. Our theme for 2020 is winning the small battles. And we cannot have success unless we are winning the small decisions in the trenches of our lives each and every day. We need to be prepared for each small battle that we face every day. My proposition here this morning is this. A Christian cannot fight spiritual battles without being prepared. A Christian cannot fight spiritual battles without being prepared. Now, I understand that many people are pacifists, and they don't want to fight battles. But this is what comes down to our weekly goals. We have two goals this week. Number one, we need to accept that battles are part of the Christian life. Scripture clearly says that we have spiritual battles. But number two, we need to know the qualities that are necessary to prepare for battle. 
Are you ready to war the warfare that God wants you to fight against Satan, the world, and the flesh? There's not some mysterious formula to being a super Christian. It comes down to simply living for the Lord one step at a time, making the small decisions important ones. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to look at two of my favorite characters in all the Bible and show how they prepared for battle. Now, they're very different individuals, and perhaps you will be more attracted to one to emulate his behavior than the other. But both are very successful in the way that they prepared for battle. The first person I want to draw your attention to is a man by the name of Joshua. So take your Bibles and go with me to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. The first character we'll look at this morning is Joshua. He serves as a great illustration so we can prepare for battle. We can emulate his behavior. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore rise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, into the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Joshua had been training for this moment under Moses for over 40 years. Joshua is one of the spies that went into the promised land prior to the wilderness wanderings. He and Caleb came back saying, let's go. God is blessed. God has promised. There's nothing to fear. Yet ten spies were lacking in their faith and confidence in the Lord. And so Israel ended up wandering until that generation died off for 40 years. When Joshua comes to the scene here, it's very important that you understand his name. His name is Yahweh is Salvation. Yahweh is salvation. Joshua is one of history's greatest military strategists. And of course, his wisdom comes from the Lord because he relies on the Lord. And he's going to set forth what he has learned in the past under Moses and what God is going to teach him how to lead this nation into the promised land. And so the first thing that we actually see is for Joshua to be successful in the future battles that are coming, he has to do this. Trust in the promises of God. That's not new information to you. That's not surprising. But he has to trust in the promises of God. You understand that Joshua has a serious problem on his hands. Moses, the Savior, the type of Christ, of Israel, who led them out of Egypt, is dead. He's gone. God has taken him to glory. How is Joshua supposed to fill Moses' shoes? The first step that Joshua has to understand is that he needs to trust in God's promises. When God speaks, Joshua needs to listen, and Joshua needs to trust. Look at verse 3. God makes this promise, And every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that I have given unto you, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness... And this Lebanon, even to the great river, the river Euphrates, and the land of the Hittites, under the great sea toward, and going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not be any man able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor will I forsake thee. God gives Joshua two promises. One is not a promise directly to him. He inherits it as a child of Israel. The promise actually extends all the way back to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, Genesis 15, Genesis 17. We know it as the Abrahamic covenant. 
God promises Abraham's family will be great. Through that family, all the nations of the world shall be blessed. That promise is given down to Isaac, Jacob. The children of Israel are in bondage. When they come out of bondage, they still are the recipients of that promise. That's the whole purpose of Moses leading them out. And so God comes to Joshua and says, I'm not abandoning the purpose of the children of Israel marching towards this land. The promise is still yours. I gave it to Moses, and it's still given to you this day. But the second thing is that verse 5 is so significant for Joshua. As I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Now, Joshua's going to do many different things, military campaign leading two million people across a raging Jordan River at flood stage, coming into Jericho and seeing the walls fall without a single sword raised. He's going to do things that you and I are not called to do. But there is this eternal principle to Joshua that applies to the Christian. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. And just like I was with Moses, I will be with you too. Let me ask you this. What more could Joshua need? He has the promise of God to take the land, and now he has the commission of God that God is never going to leave him or forsake him. I think sometimes we think about it this way. Well, it doesn't mean that Joshua has a great job. It doesn't mean that he's going to have a big house a nice car, a boat, investments, a 401k. He's not going to have many very luxuries during this life. Frankly, he didn't need any of it. He was promised by God that he would be blessed and God would be with him. What more does a person need? And as spoiled Americans, we could say, we do appreciate the luxuries and the benefits of being in this country. I understand that we are under a stay-at-home order. But I'm thankful that we have homes to stay at. There are people that are all around this world living in cardboard boxes that we don't have that problem. God has promised us that he would never leave us nor forsake us, just like Moses, just like Joshua. You understand there are approximately 8,810 promises in the Bible. I didn't count them all. That's what scholars tell me. In the Old Testament, there are 7,700 alone. In the New Testament, there's about 1,100. Deuteronomy 28 has the most promises of any chapter in Scripture. It is 133 to the children of Israel. Now, not all these 8,800 promises are to the Christian. Some have suggested as many 500 in the New Testament are directly, directed directly to the Christians. It may be a little bit more than that. What are the promises of God? You understand that many Christians don't actually know the promises of God to them because they don't sit down and read their Bible. Some Christians are too busy sitting on the premises of the church and they ought to be standing on the promises of God. If you ignore the promises of God, you're going to be defeated long before you ever enter into battle. In order to prepare for battle, you have to trust God's promises. And that means getting in the word and taking it literally when it's given to you and obeying it no matter what the cost. Do you trust the promises of God? Second of all, Joshua had to obey God's commands. Look at verse number six. Be strong. And of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide inheritance, the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all of the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. Thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. 
for then shalt thou shalt uh, thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then shalt thou have good success verse number nine have not i commanded thee be strong and of a good courage be not afraid neither be thou dismayed for the lord thy god is with thee whither soever thou goest let me ask you something do you think Joshua was frightened to take over for Moses? We don't think of the biblical characters that way. We usually think they have this super mentality of faith that we have no access to. Well, let me ask you this. Why would God make this command three times in these verses, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, if Joshua wasn't afraid? I think Joshua was shaking in his sandals at the opportunity that was in front of him that God wanted him to do. Joshua would only succeed if he chose to obey God's commands. He's considered the greatest biblical military leader. But you understand even military leaders have to follow orders of someone. Roger Staubach led the Dallas Cowboys to the World Championship in 1971. Admitted that his position at quarterback was very frustrating to him because Coach Landry, one of the greatest coaches of all time, didn't allow Staubach to call his own plays. And so... A play would be called, but Landry would call in and change the play because he had a better idea. And Staubach admitted that Landry was typically right. And even though Roger was considered a great quarterback, he learned that he had a coach that had a genius mind when it came to football strategy. And so he actually said, I faced up to the issue of obedience. Once I learned to obey there was harmony, fulfillment, and victory, and we won the championship. You understand that you as a Christian have the duty to submit to God's authority and obey his commands. You can't get into the heat of battle and expect to obey when you've not been obeying God in the small little battles of life. You're not just going to all of a sudden forge yourself into this great holy person when you haven't been, haven't been faithful one step at a time winning the small battles. Now there is this idea that Joshua is struggling with his fear. That's not the topic of our message this morning, but let me just address this for a moment. Everyone is familiar with fear and anxiety. It's a problem of epidemic proportions. Anxiety and distress about future uncertainties is very common. It's characterized by a mental agitation, a nervousness, uneasiness. Anxiety and fear can be mild or it can be severe. It primarily has to do with what may happen in the future. Either it's near or distant, it makes no difference. Yet as prevalent as it is, anxiety, fear, and worry is one of the most counterproductive things a Christian can do. Anxiety is like a rocking chair. It'll give you something to do, but you're not going to get anywhere. God says specifically in this text, don't be afraid. Are you afraid of this coronavirus? your job, your income, all the things that you think that have to be done in order for you to live. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Christian, what more do you need? I didn't say, what more do you want? But if you change your wants into what God's wants, you're going to really find God's blessing. 
he will meet your need. Joshua had to take the promises of God. Joshua has to obey the commands of God. And number three, Joshua had to remember God's faithfulness. Look down to verse 10. Then Joshua commanded all the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the host, and command all the people, saying, Prepare your victuals, for within three days we shall pass over the Jordan to go to the promised land, which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it. And to the Reubenites, and to the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, he spake, saying, Remember the word which Moses the servant of the Lord commanded you, saying, The Lord your God has given you rest, and hath given you this land. Joshua's excited, but he also realizes that part of the tribes of Israel are not coming into the promised land with him. And he now points back, he's not going to have spiritual influence and spiritual guidance over these lands. And what does he tell them to do? You must remember what God has done in the past. You've got to remember the promises. You've got to remember what God wants you to do. Joshua makes this command. Isn't it amazing, though, if we go through Israel's history, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, even in the book of the Exodus, does Israel actually remember what God has done for them? <laughs> the answer is no, they don't. How short is Israel's memory? It's almost as short as mine. God proves his power to them over and over. While in Egypt, they saw God perform miracles and plagues to deliver them. He changed the heart of the king, Pharaoh. They forgot. They got into the wilderness and whined and cried and want to go back to Egypt. God rips apart the Red Sea. They go across on dry ground. They delivered. Amazing how the next thing they do is simply complain. Moses, you brought us out here to die. We'd rather be in Egypt. They get to Mount Sinai. They see God's Shekinah glory. Thunder and lightning roaring from the top of the mountain. They hear the voice of God giving them the Ten Commandments prior to it being written down. What do they do? They forget. And they make a golden calf. Over and over and over again, Israel will not remember what God has done. Are we any better? You know, so many Christians fail to remember the victories that God has brought them through in the past. Spiritual victories, self-victories, family victories, victories over sin, financial victories to pay the bills, wisdom, health, whatever it may be. We tend to forget what God has done for us because we're so caught up in the heat of a moment of what we want now that we don't sit back and count our blessings to what God has done in the past. And so Joshua tells these tribes that are not under his influence, make sure you remember. You have to remember the word that Moses gave to you. Are you one that remembers and cherishes the victories and the promises of God in your life of what he has done in the past to prove himself? God does not have to prove himself to you again, but he will if you let him. He has proven enough through the death of his son that he is willing to give it all. Are you willing to trust? Joshua is a great example for preparation of battle. He tells us and guides us in wonderful ways of how to start preparing. I want to look at a second character this morning very quickly. Go over with me to 1 Samuel 17. First Samuel 17, maybe one of your favorite chapters in Scripture. It's the story of David and Goliath. We're not going to go through the whole chapter. I just want to give you a few highlights. David is a favorite Bible character for many. He also serves as a great example as a youth when he defeated Goliath. David's very different than Joshua. Joshua is mature. He's been training under Moses for over 40 years. 
He's a seasoned veteran who has studied and learned God's faithfulness under the greatest prophet to live in Israel in the Old Testament. David is very different. He's a young shepherd boy. He doesn't have much experience leading people or winning great spiritual victories. Yet this little boy has incredible, profound faith and wisdom. And he's going to teach us some things that are very important in preparing for the battle. The very first thing that I want to draw your attention to is that David is faithful in the little things of life. David is faithful in the little things of life. Look at chapter 17, verse number 12. Now David was the son of that Ephratite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse. He had eight sons. The man went among them, for an old man in the days was Saul. Three of the eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to battle. The names of these three sons were Eliab, the firstborn, next Abinadab, and the third Shema. David was the youngest of the three eldest who followed Saul. And David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Many forget that before David was a king, he was a stinky little shepherd boy. It's not an easy job being a shepherd. It's difficult. It's dirty dealing with animals. When David is presented here in chapter 17, most people don't realize that he's already been anointed as the next king of Israel one chapter before. And so David, who is the rightful heir to the throne of Israel, is tending sheep. Do you know how demeaning it would be for an anointed king to go and tend sheep? How demeaning would it be to be kept away from the battle, away from his brothers who are fighting on the front lines? How demeaning was it to be another king's armor bearer when you know for a fact that God has removed his blessing from that awful king and you are going to replace him? And the bloodline of that king, Saul, would never rule and reign again in Israel. How difficult would it have been to watch this king lead Israel away from the Lord when your heart wants to lead the nation to the Lord? You realize that David just simply does the task that he is called to do, and that's it. It's not time for him to be the king. And so he is satisfied and he is grateful to watch his father's sheep. Jesus says in Luke 16, 10, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And that is unjust and the least shall also be unjust in much. Most people want to be faithful in much before they're ever faithful in little. It just doesn't work that way. Has God called you to be a CEO of a major corporation? Then you be the most godly servant in that capacity that you can be. Has God called you to be a burger flipper? Then you be the best burger flipper that you can be. Has God called you to be flat on your back, unemployed, out of work, and what seems to you to be a mess in your life? Well, you be the most godly, flat-on-your-back, unemployed, messy servant that you could ever be. God simply wants you to be faithful with what you have. Not only was David faithful with what he was given, because he was faithful in little, what did God eventually do? Made him faithful in much, and he is the greatest king of Israel prior to Jesus sitting on the throne of David. Are you faithful in little things? Is it easy to stay home during this pandemic and be faithful to the Lord? No. But you be faithful one step at a time in what God has called you to do. Number two, David is zealous for God's name. Verse 26. 
David spoke to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? Taketh away the reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? David hears Goliath's mouth rambling on the battlefield. David wants to know, who's going out to take care of this fella? This gross, pagan, defying God? Who is marching out to battle this man? David is shocked. David is grieved and angered that a pagan would irreverently mock the living God this way. And so instantly, he wants to stand up and defend God's honor regardless of his life. Why is David doing this? What's his motive? I don't think it's to promote himself to defend God's name. He's not looking for his own glory here. His glory will come. He's already anointed the king of Israel. I think sincerely David is looking at the situation and saying, listen, if no one is stepping up, I'm going to. If no one is speaking the truth, if no one is stepping out by faith, I am going to, and it doesn't really matter if no one else will. I am going to be the man of God. It shows us that David just didn't have this mental knowledge that God is with me. But rather, the fact that God is with him changes his behavior and forces him to walk by faith. Psalm 23 you probably have it memorized. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. On what occasion do most people read Psalm or hear Psalm 23? Funerals. It is so sad to me. For David was not an old man on his deathbed when he wrote Psalm 23. It's just the opposite. David is a young shepherd boy who slew a bear and a lion. This little boy wrote, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He's zealous for the Lord. He has a perspective that most Christians don't have. The events of the day that David slew Goliath are burned into our hearts. That shepherd boy, a handful of stones, the brook, the homemade weapon, the unbeatable army. You understand in all that, Goliath was the underdog. David was God's man. David was never the underdog. David defeated that giant and became an instant, enduring hero for all ages because he understood that living in the presence of God is practical and not theological. David was just as zealous for God, whether it is a dirty shepherd boy or is a glorious king over Israel. The zeal for his God was not relative to his situation, and nor should it be for ours. Be zealous for the Lord and stand for his name. Number three, David was unfazed by criticism. Verse 28, Eliab, his eldest brother, heard him speaking, and he criticizes him. He says, why'd you come down here? With whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride. Do you ever pause to think about David's criticism and his biggest critic? It wasn't necessarily King Saul. It wasn't the sheep under him wasn't even the rest of the army. It was his family. Now, it's difficult to know Eliab's motivation for criticizing David, but I want to point out something. Eliab was present when David was anointed as the next king of Israel. Eliab watched Samuel pass over Eliab and go and ask for, is there anyone else in this family? Eliab knew who David was. Can you say jealousy much? <laughs> Resentment? 
whatever the reason for the false accusation, it's unfounded and baseless. Why didn't Eliab himself, as the eldest son of Jesse, the mighty warrior, run out and slay Goliath in the name of God? Could he have done so? I believe that God would have blessed it. And we'd be reading about Eliab here killing Goliath and not David, but Eliab didn't. That criticism from family did not deter David in doing what needed to be done. Few things are more stressful or discouraging than having your family members turn against you. Well, I think Christians should be open to criticism and correction. But in this case, Eliab was attacking David without a cause. It took faith for David to brush that attack aside and get on with God's work. Just understand that Jesus faced the same thing. His family members tried to have him committed as mentally insane. You must be faithful in what God has called you to do regardless of who criticizes you. The only one you are responsible for to is Jesus Christ. You are responsible for yourself directly to the Lord. It is you who have to give an account before him at the judgment seat of Christ and not anybody else. You give account for yourself. You let God take care of the criticism from your family. What ends up happening to Eliab? He's not really a very large biblical character, is he? But David is, because he's faithful. Finally this morning, be confident in God's power. Look at verse 34. David sent unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep. There came a lion and a bear, and I took a lamb out of the flock, and I went out after him, and I smote him, I delivered out of his mouth, and when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and I smote him, and I slew him. Your servant slew both a lion and a bear. This uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defiled the armies of the living God. <laughs> it's an incredible two set of verses here. You know, David's way of thinking is actually priceless. It's so simplistic, but it's so faithful. It should be our goal as believers. I have no doubt that David's humanity was fearful in these circumstances. But he didn't let it get in the way, did he? It's just that his faith was stronger than his fear. David's logic is this. If God can deliver me out of the mouth of a lion, out of the mouth of a bear... He owns this natural creation. Why isn't this giant going to be the same thing? What is the difference between a lion, a bear, or a giant when God is the one doing the fighting? And the answer, of course, there is no difference. And so what David does is he reflects on a victory of God's power in the past, and he assumes that since God is with him, he is going to give the same victory in the future. Because that is the strength, and that is the character of God. David knew the source of fear was nothing but a giant windbag. A pretty big giant windbag, but nevertheless, a windbag who could not stand up to the power of God. God delights in using the weak vessels of this world, as long as those vessels are willing to recognize that God's strength needs to be their strength. Psalm 27, 1, The Lord is my light and mine salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 118, verse 6, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Psalm 56, 3-4, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee, in God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. 2 Timothy 1.7, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. David knew and remembered the power of God from what God had done in the past. Are you ready to fight your spiritual warfare? 
I went to the United States Army website, and I wanted to answer this question. What does it, uh, what does it take to become a member of the United States Army? I read these qualifications. You have to be a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident. You have to be between 17 and 34 years old. You have to meet medical, moral, and physical requirements. You have to have a high school graduate uh, or somewhere uh, as an equivalent. Recruits will generally then take five steps as they enlist to be soldiers. Number one, take the Armed Forces Vocational Aptitude Battery. Your score in this test will determine which Army job you are qualified to hold. Number two, pass an Army physical. Number three, meet with a career counselor to discuss and accept your Army job. Number four, take the oath of enlistment. Number five, ship off to basic training. After the recruit has completed basic training, he or she will then attend the advanced individual training for, spe for specialized instruction in the military occupational specialty that he or she has chosen. Upon graduating AIT, they will now receive orders to join their unit. Do you understand the extreme preparation a soldier must go through? before joining their unit that is now placed into the battle. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of time. You don't sign your name away and the next day you're on the battlefield. It just doesn't work that way. And so when we come to the spiritual life, it takes a lot of preparation. It takes a lot of hard work fighting each and every day just to be faithful. Joshua is a great example. David is a great example. They did the little things each and every day that we need to do. So let me end just by asking you three questions. Are you on active duty or are you a pacifist? Are you on active duty, reporting for duty today to serve the Lord, the King of Kings, or are you a pacifist? I wonder if a pacifist could ever be looked at as a deserter. Number two, when was the last time God directly encouraged you and prepared you for a battle against the devil, the flesh, and the world? I ask that question because many Christians will be able to say, I have no idea. It's because they're not living for the Lord day after day, moment by moment, winning the small battles. If you're willing to give yourself to the Lord, you learn day by day. He will prepare you. Number three, what do you need? to prepare for battle each day. What do you need to prepare for battle each day? I think the biggest thing that we need is an open heart and then a willingness to obey. Are you willing to start preparing for spiritual battles? Faithful Christians don't happen by luck, coincidence. The people in this hall of fame or hall of faith in Hebrews 11, oh, they have their flaws. But they were forged. One choice at a time. And you must put yourself in a position to be forged by the Lord for battle by being faithful today and win the small battles of life. A Christian cannot fight spiritual battles without being prepared. Get into your Bibles and make sure you are prepared. Father, I pray that you would guide and direct us, that you would bless us, that you'd give us wisdom. Lord, I know that this message this morning is applicable to this pastor and everyone listening. We have to do what is right on a daily basis and we realize that what we are doing is right is actually fighting the battle you've called us to do. We can stand strong in the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.